<laughs> Welcome back to another episode of the Ohio Bass Podcast. I'm your host, Nick. You can follow me on X or on TikTok at Ohio underscore bass on Instagram or threads at Ohio underscore bass underscore outdoors. You can always email the show at the Ohio Bass Podcast at gmail.com or join our large listening community on Pandora, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Apple, Amazon Music, Audacity, TuneIn, YouTube, and more. Recognize. So I am super, super pumped up for this guest. Not because he has a large social media following, but because I'm actually a fan. Because I am one of the people that's been following him for years. I'll sit down and watch this program on YouTube. I'll watch one after another after another. And I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot. And not only is he really insightful, he's a hell of a filmmaker. So I reached out. I said, hey, do you maybe have an hour to to hop on? You know, I have a a lot of questions that maybe you cover in a bunch of different episodes, but maybe we can put them all together in one setting. And he said, yeah, absolutely, as long as I'm able to be on the water. And I said, <laughs> you know, what would be more fitting? Talking about fishing while you're fishing. <laughs> so I always prepare a lot of questions when guests come on, obviously. But this time, this time I had like four sheets of paper. I have things underlined. I have arrows pointing to other questions, things circled, things highlighted, things wrote down twice. And what I really wanted to do is I wanted to have someone take away new information no matter what skill level you're at. Whether you've been catfishing for 20 years, a couple years, or just getting started. So it'd be real easy for me to throw questions together for 45 minutes about different rod setups. But I was thinking, how can I keep everybody engaged? What would be the questions that I would want asked if I was listening to the podcast? And my very first question is simple. How do you locate fish on a new body of water? And does it change if that's a lake or a river? How do the seasons dictate your strategy? What are some of the biggest differences between big blue catfish and big flatheads? We do talk about baits. We do talk about rigs. We do talk about rod setups. And obviously I wanted to bring up his YouTube channel because like I said, I've been watching him just crush giant catfish on a weekly basis for years. And ask him about, you know, he is a guide. Can you walk us through an average trip? You know, what should we bring? What shouldn't we bring? What should we expect on an outing? He does overnight camp and cook trips. It just looks amazing. You know, do I now get a discount because you've been on the podcast? (laughs) Kidding. But no, just an awesome, one of the most genuine and authentic people I've ever talked to, um, especially interviewed, uh, probably my favorite interview, and I'm so excited for everybody to listen to this. All right, real quick, little housekeeping. So if you ever listened to the podcast before or follow me on social media, you'll know that I've been working with a company called Deeper Sonar for over seven years. If you didn't know, Deeper Sonar is a company based in Europe, They've sold to units over 52 different countries in the world, and their app has over 2 million downloads. And what Deeper Sonar did was invent a portable, castable death finder using Wi-Fi that will give you real-time data underneath the water to any smart device. Now, it's important to know it's not the Wi-Fi that you're using right now to stream this podcast. It's the Wi-Fi built into the Sonar unit, so you can use this anywhere, even without cell phone coverage. Along with the Wi-Fi, you'll get 330 feet plus of coverage. Unlike competitors that are still using Bluetooth, well, you're going to lose range in about 40 feet. So I'm not going to talk about all the features they have on their app. Uh, There's a ton. Like I said, you can download it. It's free. You can check it out yourself. And if you're interested in purchasing a deeper sonar or accessory, you can use my promo code OHIOBASS, all caps, all one word. Type it in. You'll get a discount. I'll get a nice little kickback. You'll get an awesome product, and you'll help support the show. No, seriously, come on, do it. Do it. All right, so that's all I have for an open. Again, I always appreciate all the support and everybody listening. If you have a quick second, please give us a like or a comment or a review on whichever app you're listening to us on. And not just for the guests coming up now, but for all of our guests. You know, if we want to continue to get quality anglers from all over the country, give them a follow too. So, with all that being said, let's hit it.
All right, let's head to the hotline presented by Deeper Sonar. Head to deepersonar.com to check out the new Cutting Edge Quest bait boat. So, as advertised, we're bringing on a multi-species angler, someone I've been following on YouTube for years. He specializes in crushing giant catfish. His name is Spencer Bauer, but he's also known as River Certified. Spencer, how are you doing today, my friend? Uh, pretty good. If uh, I get a bite, we might have some like action going down during the whole thing. And you're actually fishing right now, correct? Yep, pulling boards right now. <laughs> That's awesome. So in the beginning, I always like to ask first, maybe if you could give us a little background, just let us know where you're from, what you grew up fishing for, maybe what you're doing now, and I'll just kind of leave it open-ended for you. Well, I mean, the, the first fishing thing that popped up in my head when you said, like, you know, growing up and stuff was there was a picture of me. My dad was holding me, and I was probably like five or six, and he had a bluegill in his hand, and I was like bawling my eyes out because <laughs> so, apparently I was scared of it. So yeah, I, I've kind of hypothesized that maybe I like fishing because uh, they scared me when I was young, and I, I'm just mad at them now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, man. Like I grew up in Iowa, farm pond country, southern southern Iowa's farm pond country for sure. Grew up chasing bluegills and and bass and um i didn't have like a whole bunch of people who liked to fish in my family but i had a whole bunch of people who were willing to take me fishing that was cool you know like um i had plenty of opportunity and so yeah fish farm ponds got a bunch of bass bluegills crappie occasional catfish but the mecca where i i grew up there was the creek which was just a small stream that dumped into a reservoir that was loaded with channel cats and subsequently the the creek was loaded with channel cats and the day i was old enough where my dad gave me the green light to go there by myself or with some buddies was like you know like a super special day and and chasing catfish and uh, a lot of other fish too but primarily catfish for i mean ever since you know the fish yep. seems like every year i just fish a little bit more and a little bit more which that's my new year's resolution every year is to fish one day more than I did the year before. And I'm pretty, pretty solid on that resolution so far. So nice. So I know that you're a multi-species angler, but what made you gravitate toward giant catfish? They get big. I mean, they get big and they fight hard and they're not a tuna, you know, where they're going to bust off a 150 yard run sizzling, but they got the endurance that, you uh, I argue no other freshwater fish have and you know the they're the preeminent freshwater big game fish in north america along with you know some alligator gar and sturgeon but availability is a big thing you know you can catch catfish about uh, at least channel cats all over the country yeah. where alligator gar and sturgeon are kind of limited in their range so between the availability and the fact they get big and fight hard it's I mean, I, I thought that was cool from a very young age, and like I said, it probably gets worse every year. Yeah. So you mentioned that you wanted to fish one more day each year. How many days a year do you typically fish? Oh, I'm I'm over 200 days on the water for sure. Wow. Yeah. So do you mostly fish new places or the same locations? Um, I would say mostly new places. Like there's some there's some overlap, but uh, I mean, at this moment, I'm fishing a section of I'm on a reservoir that I fished a fair amount this winter, um, but I'm on a section I've never fished before at the moment just to see see what it does. Um, I, I like the exploring, you know, like I, I'll be, I'll get bored with things if I do the same thing in the same places all the time. That makes sense. So I have a two-part question here. One, how do you locate fish on a new body of water? And two, do you approach it differently, let's say, if you're fishing a large lake opposed to, like, a river system? Um, I mean, a reservoir is the easiest one, or at least the, the most straightforward one, because uh, you can break a reservoir into thirds. You got the main body, the main lake section, you got the river section, and then you got the section in the middle where it kind of transitions to river. And mm -hmm. Different different times of year, the bulk of the population is in one section or the other. So, right now, I I mean, it's it's spring. Catfish are pushing up river because of like just spawning urges and whatnot. And 
I'm fishing the section where the the reservoir turns to a river. I'm going to start here. I mean, every day is different. So I'll start here. And if I don't catch anything, then I'm going to head upriver and try the, the river section. So are there any certain things that you're looking for, like structure, maybe elevation changes, creek channels, things like that? Um, I heard a quote the other day that was pretty good, and it's not entirely, it, it was for bass, but it applies in, in, to catfish in a large way. It's, so not all structure holds catfish, but all catfish, re, or not all, all structure holds bass, but all bass relate to structure. Yeah. And, and then uh, I think that kind of applies to catfish where the structure, I mean, or maybe it was cover. I don't know. It's something along those lines, but yeah, I mean, catfish relate to differences, even, even on like a big mud flat, there's going to be little divots and potholes that hold more fish and, I mean, I'm always looking for that stuff. Sometimes it's more effective than others, but yeah. that's something I'm always looking for, for sure. So you mentioned that it's spring. Is that something that comes into your mind when you're trying to search for a new spot, maybe the time of year? Or are there other elements, like maybe the, the water's really high or really low today? Oh, yeah. And it's all an educated guess based on past experiences. I mean, everybody says time on the water is the most important thing, which I agree 100%. Because without that time on the water, you, you don't make as good of educated guesses. Yeah. But if you, I mean, if you only fish a certain scenario and that's all you do, you know, you can gather that data real quick and, and be proficient in that type of waterway, like a reservoir versus a river or just like a natural lake. And then there's different types of reservoirs and stuff too. You know, like there's, there's all kinds of little variables and, and maybe I'm, I overthink it. Like that's a real possibility lots of times, but yeah, yeah the it, it's, you go out there, you try something that you think is going to work. And if it works, you remember it. And if it doesn't work, you also remember it. And then you think about time of year and water level and that type of stuff and try to replicate it. And if it's repl replicable, it's a pattern. You can do it in the future. So we probably have a lot of people listening right now that only fish from the shore, maybe just on the weekends. So let's say somebody found a good catfish lake. They're on Google Maps looking around for a spot. What advice would you give them? Well, I guess, I mean, the concept stays the same because the fish are going to do what the fish are going to do. But mobility is still key, even from the bank. Like, I mean, put on your hiking boots. And one thing I always did that was make sure I, I didn't bring a, any more stuff than I had to. You know, like at a backpack and carry some rods in your hands and, and then you try to limit it as much as possible. That way you can get to those spots that other people don't want to or have a tough time getting at, you know. And So that's the biggest thing. And then a kayak, like I love kayak fishing. I still do a lot of kayak fishing. And that kind of opens up a lot of a lot of doors to, to get to a new bank fishing spot. Like you don't even have to fish out of the kayak. You just use the kayak to haul your stuff. But yeah, I'd say keeping it as simple as possible makes you as mobile as possible and you can get in those, those spots that other people don't get at. So this question is kind of vague, but it's meant to be vague on purpose. What are some of the biggest differences you see between flathead catfish, blue catfish, and even channel catfish? I mean, a flathead in particular is just, like there's a lot of fish that have a lot of crossover. You know, like a walleye and a channel catfish aren't that much different in in where they live and, and what they do during different water conditions. Like their spawning practices are a little different, but they relate to a lot of similar things. Mm -hmm. um, a flathead is about as pull, like a flathead is, I would argue, the most unique uh, predatory fish, like a fish that people target on a regular basis. Like there's... I, I can't think of any fish that's any more different from all other fish out there than a flathead. Like they're, they apex predators and they do whatever they want, whenever they want, essentially. But there, I mean, there's a little crossover cause they're both a fish, but I mean, a blue and a flathead are about as much alike as a blue and a bluegill. Yeah. <laughs> like they're, they're that, that much different. I'd say uh, maybe a, a closer comparison would be like a blue in a channel. And I think a lot of people who don't fish for blues think of blues as just big channel cats. And they are definitely not like they are their own thing. They do their own thing. 
there's definitely a little bit of crossover, but not nearly as much as like at one point in time, I like to think and spent a lot of time fishing for them, especially the last three or four years. And every time it's just like, wow, these fish are weird, man. Like they just, they'll be really shallow at times when you wouldn't expect them to be really shallow. And then at any given time, you could catch a blue cat out of two foot of water. You could catch them out of 82 foot of water. Like they're, they're all over the place. And all right, so I have a bunch of different bait questions. Like, would you use a different bait for flathead or for blue catfish? Sure. You're setting yourself up. I, get, I, I respect that. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. So another loaded question, all right? What is your favorite bait? I mean, my favorite bait is, I, I have some favorites, but usually it's based on what's native. Okay. So I'm I'm on the Tennessee River right now, and it has a... a like an extremely large population of gizzard shad, like big gizzard shad, mm-hmm. and then skipjack herring. So um, those are two of my favorite baits in bodies of water that have them. So I'm using gizzard shad and skipjack herring. But if I went to Iowa, like I will be in a couple weeks, I'm, I mean, I'm not bringing any skipjack home with me because at least in the central Iowa bodies of water, they, they don't do that great. Like you're better off with shad or or white bass and stuff like that. So my biggest, I mean, biggest thing is what's native to your watershed. I'll be using a bunch of creek chubs when I get back home, some suckers, green sunfish, bullheads, that type of stuff, just depending on what are the catfish I'm targeting. So we have a big rumor in this area that you can't catch flathead catfish on cut bait. What do you think about that? Oh, I'm targeting flatheads right now with cut bait. And if you could, give a percentage of like how often you use cut bait and how often you use live bait. Let's say you have 10 rods. How many have cut bait? How many have live bait? Uh, I mean, here I'm using all cut bait right now. Uh, so I got six rods out and all six got cut bait on them. But I mean, back in Iowa, I'll use a lot more live bait, but I'll still work in cut bait. Uh, it just depends on what I'm doing. Uh, if I'm fishing out of my boat where I have the ability to haul like a ton of bait, then I'll bring live bait and cut bait. But if I'm out of a kayak or on the bank, I'll bring all live bait and I'll put all live bait out. And then if I have a channel cat come through and uh, kill one of my live baits and not eat it, Mm -hmm. then that becomes my cut bait. And I don't feel bad about throwing that out there. Not one bit. So how long would you put a piece of cut bait on before you reel it in and change it out for a new one? It just depends on how big it is. Like a giant, like a really big, like you take a hand-sized bluegill and snip the tail off and then maybe make a slice down the side so it bleeds out. And like that's a a pretty substantial bait. And I'll leave that out there an hour and feel good about it. Um, I might leave it out there longer than that. Like if, I mean, sometimes you just fall asleep with fishing rods out and stuff. And Mm -hmm. so then, then it sits out there longer. But as far as being the most effective it can be, I'd say half hour to an hour for those big ones. And 15 minutes to a half hour for smaller chunks like you know your thumb size channel cat chunk of sucker or get or shad okay that I'm, I'm i'm swapping that out every 15 to 30 minutes probably oh <laughs> well i just learned something so apparently i'm putting my cut bait out for too long man i mean you can still catch fish like there's one that sticks out in my head from this summer i had a, a chunk of uh silver carp and i was blue cat fishing primarily and it sat out there for eight hours and then a flathead picked it up first thing in the morning and i'm sure that was the grossest nastiest chunk of cut bait you've ever seen in your life and he still ate it yeah but but is it as effective as it could be no but am i gonna wake up at three in the morning to rebate sometimes you know sometimes it just depends on how much i'm fishing like if i'm fishing all the time and i get a little bit lazier and if i'm not fishing as much then i'm a little more johnny on the spot for that kind of stuff so how do you decide what size of cut bait to use? Um, yeah, I mean, species or just the size of fish and the body of water you're fishing. And like if I'm channel cat fishing, uh, a size of cut bait or a chunk of cut bait, you know, the, the last digit on your thumb is pretty good for two to five pound fish, one to five pound fish. But mm-hmm. if you're if you're on a body, body of water with like giant blues and flatheads like I'm on right now, I, I got a chunk of skipjack out that probably weighs a pound and a half. <laughs> But then, I, but then I mix it up with smaller baits too. I got, you know, some some baits that are the size of a folded up dollar bill, you know, and mm-hmm. and it's funny how you throw those giant baits out and they get roasted um, by like a fifteen pounder, 
but the the fifty pounder eats the little chunk. Happens all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of funny. It's almost like that way for every kind of fish. Like I just caught a really nice musky off a bait designed for walleye, like this tiny little husky jerk. All my musky, which I don't target them, it's more exaggerated. I'm sure for you targeted them and everything, but uh, all mine have been walleye bycatch. And not, I mean, there's a time of year where you're throwing five, six inch swim baits for walleyes, but all my muskies that I picked up have been on like your three, three and a half inch variety. And I mean, the biggest one I've caught was just a smidge under 50 inches. And wow. he ate a three and a half inch swim bait and got lucky and just hooked him <laughs> just like the barb went just through his lips. Nice. And then the jig was poking out just outside his mouth. But that was a crazy night. I don't, you know, I'm sure you know all about bite windows and that type of stuff. And yeah, that, that night it caught two of them and then got bit off three other times oh. throwing walleye stuff. Yeah. The, the hooks keep bending on me for those walleye baits. That's one thing I need to figure out. Putting too much heat on them, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably. Uh, let's circle back around. Let's talk about rigs. Do you use different rigs for live bait and cup bait? No, man. I just keep it simple. There's a few little tweaks and things you can do, but at the end of the day, just a simple Carolina rig can do about anything in catfishing you want. And I wanted to ask you what your favorite rig is. I know there's so many different kinds, you know, like the three-way rig's really popular now. Well, that's just, I mean, that's what I was getting at is, uh, you can modify it. So a three-way is just a modified Carolina rig. Okay. You know, and then you could have a fixed sinker. You could have a sliding sinker. You can, you can add a bobber above your sinker. You can add a bobber between your sinker and your hook. You know, like all those are just modified Carolina rigs. But the, the foundation is the Carolina rig. But I mean, right now I got Carolina rigs out. The the leaders are two and a half to four foot long, and I got a float between the weight and the hook just to keep the bait up off the bottom. And I'm just dragging them behind the boat about point. Four mile an hour, 0.5. Do you ever use a float? Oh, yeah. Every chance, every time that it makes sense. Like, uh, I'd be telling you, I mean, quite honest, like, if I can catch them on a bobber, I want to catch them on a bobber because I like watching that bobber go under. But yeah. there's there's a lot of times where it doesn't make sense. Like, I'm dragging baits in 25 foot of water, and it wouldn't be as effective to uh, drag, a, drag a float behind me. Or, but I don't know. I guess I haven't tried it that much do it in this type of thing which maybe i should but i think hanging a, a, a fishing rod off the side of the boat accomplishes the same thing in this instance but if i'm fishing a big expansive mud flat with fish scattered even if you're looking for like little depressions and pieces of structure that concentrate a few more casting a bobber out and letting it drag on the bottom and let it like free spool and let it drift for 10, 15, 20 feet, and then stop it for like five, 10 minutes, and then let it drift another 10, 15, 20 feet and stop it and let it sit for another five, 10 minutes. And you can cover a little bit of ground and help run across some scattered fish. So I have a friend named Dirk Fields. Shout out Dirk. Uh, he's on the podcast before, and he brought me up to speed about bridling baits. And I've watched a lot of your videos, not all of them, but have you ever tried that technique? Um, I, I mean, for, it's a great idea for delicate baits, like, uh, live shad. If you're going to fish a live shad mm -hmm. running a, a tiny zip tie through their nose and then zip tying your, your hook to their nose is, it just seemed to last a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Um, but lots of times, at least for me, it's convenience. I mean, I have a bridling kit, I have a bait needle, I have all the floss and stuff. I just forget about it, <laughs> to oh, tell yeah. you the truth. <laughs> yeah, I just, I know that he uses it all the time and loves it. And I wasn't sure if it's like, maybe sometimes it's just not practical, whether it's like the current is too much or there's, you know, just too much stuff under the water. No, there's, there's a lot of different ways to do it. You don't have to bridle them through the nose, but that seems to be the most common. You could take a, a bait needle and run it right behind their dorsal fin or or like i was saying i, I got a bunch of little zip ties that I'll, I'll run that zip tie through their nose and then zip tie the hook to them but uh, i haven't done it for a year or two just i mean i, I don't think it's necessary for cut bait but it but it's a, a wrinkle that that's not it's not a bad thing to experiment with stuff like that ever so let's say that you're targeting medium to large catfish 
What would be your hook preference? There's so many different kinds. Circle hooks, kale hooks, J-style, octopus. I know you're hip to the triple threat hook. Um, I mean, so like 20 to 30 pound blues and flatheads, there's going to be some outliers, but so you're going to, you probably do have the opportunity to run into even bigger fish, but I guess that's not even all that important. The main thing is just matching the hook to your bait size. Like if you're using Goliath King Kong baits, you want a 10 or 12 odd. And mm-hmm. if you're using smaller baits, like your dollar bill size, they're half a dollar bill size. I mean, an eight odd or even down to a six odd will get the job done. Uh, those triple threats, they're, they're good circle hooks. That's if I'm going to use a circle hook, that's usually what I use. But if I'm on body of water with blues, I use the triple threats. They do a pretty good job of hooking flatheads mm-hmm. and they do a really good job of hooking blues. But if I'm on a body of water with no blue cats, I prefer a kale style where like Eagle Claw makes the, the, the kales. They used to make yeah. the king kale. I think they call it something different now. And then there's another company called uh, Hooker's Terminal Tackle, and they make one called the Mad Catter. And that's uh, more of a hybrid between a, uh, it's, it's, it's a circle or it's a, a kale with a deeper bend. So you can hook your bait a little deeper and still have plenty of hook point exposure to hook the fish. And that's probably my favorite flathead in channel cat hook right now. So I'm actually really happy you brought up that Eagle Claw kale hook because when I really started flathead fishing, probably about four years ago, that was the hook I used. But I was using floats. And then I'm trying to remember, I think it was the person responsible for running Whisker Seekers Instagram told me not to use kale hooks with floats. Were you missing fish? I was. And, you know, something would take the float down And I'd go to set the hook and and nothing would be there. And I wasn't sure if it was actually the hook. Another possibility, it it could have been smaller channels that were just nipping at it, you know, not taking the whole hook. Yeah, and both both are definite possibilities. Uh, I mean, you fish for them enough and you'll kind of start to see the difference between how a channel cat bites and a flathead bites and, and, and a blue cat bites different too. But I'd say the biggest thing is just trying to figure out what works the best for you. You know, like maybe if the kale ain't helping you out, just try regular J hook. And if a J hook ain't get the job done, then try a circle. But I mean, you can argue there's different things are better for different situations, but a lot of it's how you go about it. So like, how do you set the hook? Like, and I'd say that's the biggest thing. If you're going to set the hook, like everybody sets the hook a little different and then different hooks are more conducive to different ways of setting the hook. So that's the biggest thing is just try different stuff and figure out works, what works the best for you. Like people give you advice, but at the end of the day, you know, you got to figure out some stuff on your own. Yeah. So I have whisker seeker rods. And one of the reasons why I do is because I watched a lot of your videos, uh, you know, years ago and, and that's all you're using. And you know, my favorite color is orange. So that helps. Can you talk about some of your favorite rods and, and how you set those up? Well, I mean, a lot of it depends on what type of catfishing you're doing. Uh, one thing, people talk trash on channel cats a lot, but a lot of the people that talk trash on channel cats are using stuff that's suited for a 120-pound blue cat and say channel cats don't fight. But if you catch that same fish on a bass rod or like a super light-action trolling rod for walleyes, like, oh, yeah. that's fun. That's fun. So uh, I, I got my big cat setups and I got my small cat setups. And the big ones are the fun ones, so I'll – talk about them first i guess but then whisker seeker makes really good fishing rod i I use their medium heavies for a long time Mm -hmm. Um, i've been using ripping lips mediums and they're a little bit softer rod i'd say they're comparable to the the whisker seeker medium heavies Um, i use braid so having a little bit more forgiving rod i think is important but if you're fishing with mono you want a little bit you want a stouter fishing rod but I, I like braid i like the sensitivity of it i like how you get a direct contact to the fish yeah and i think it makes the fight more fun but if you're going to do that like i would definitely say go with a softer more forgiving fishing rod with i mean a little bit of backbone's good but you want there to be give some give throughout the entire blank and those those rods do a good job of that and I've been using a PC Fun Alios 400s, and they're basically a giant low profile, probably something similar to what you'd use musky fish in. Yeah. Uh, they'd be comparable to like Alexa, Dio Alexa 400. 
Um, but the thing that I really like about them is the price point. Like you don't sacrifice much quality, um, but you do you do get it for you know essentially half of what a Dio Alexa or a, well, I mean even I mean a third of what a Tranks would cost. What are those like three four hundred bucks? Hmm. Yeah, so I mean at a hundred and ten dollars or whatever, it's tough to beat that. And they got a solid one piece of. Uh, a uh, frame i want to say i want to say aluminum but i can't remember for sure if it's aluminum anyway it's a because of that low profile design and then that one piece frame like they'll put out 25 pounds of drag and still have the rigidity to not like flex have the gear flex and you know shear and bust teeth off they, they're, they're they're durable too on top of that so okay. i've been really pleased with them like super pleased with them and i run a lot of drag Mm-hmm. like a lot of people say they run 20 pounds of drag but a lot of the people that say that i've fished with some of them and they don't run 20 <laughs> i i promise you i like every one of these fish or all all these reels are set at like 15 to 20 right now but i don't it's not necessarily an effectiveness thing um once again i just enjoy fighting a fish like that like i enjoy the tug of war um and then i'll spool them up with 80 pound braid and then for my leaders on blue cat water i run 80 just because they hit it so dang hard that i've had several fish snap 60 in the holder but if yeah it's it's like really cool and then sad at the same time (laughs) (laughs) but for flathead water i'll run the 80 pound braid main line and uh, a 60 pound leader and i don't run that heavy braid because of the brake strength necessarily as much as the abrasion resistance like a little bit thicker diameter line holds up to rocks and logs better than 65 or 50 so i like that 80 pound braid on those big on the big rigs and for the channel cat rigs i found these super duper cheap but really conducive for catfishing blanks they're daiwa wilderness rods they got a seven foot medium that's rated for like 10 to 20 pound line and the bend uh, in them they call it a regular bend Mm -hmm. so it's got just a smidgen of backbone but um, and then a softer tip, but the transition from the tip to the backbone is this really nice gradual taper. And that's good for absorbing the shock from a big hit or any time a fish takes a run or rolls or head shakes at you. Know, that middle section of that rod does a real good job of absorbing that shock, which those rip and lips rods do the same thing. So do the whisker seekers. You know, they have that real nice taper to the blank. But so those Daiwa wilderness rods, they're like twenty five dollars, you know. Like as far as fishing rods go, they're dirt cheap, so that's pretty awesome. And so I'll I'll run those, and then uh, uh, PC Thun Alios the next size down the three hundreds, and I'll spool them up with fifty pound braid again, just because of the abrasion resistance, not because you need fifty pound line. And yeah. then for a leader, I'll run twenty or thirty on the leader, and that 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 setup's treating me pretty darn good. Nice. So, are you a full-time guide? I mean, I do a lot of things part-time. <laughs> like, I, I guide a couple days a week. Uh, Mondays and Tuesdays are my guide days. And I, right now, I'm out filming for YouTube. And, um, and then uh, I do, like, Facebook, make some money on Facebook. So, basically, guiding and then social media. All right. So, let's say that I'm a paying customer. Can you describe what it's like, maybe on an average trip, bring us behind the curtain a little bit? Uh, for catfishing trips, and I'll I'll do a little bit of other stuff, but primarily catfishing trips. So we'll start there. Uh, I run 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. unless there's somebody like my schedule's full and somebody really really wants to get in, and then I might talk to somebody already had a trip booked and ask if they'll move it to 6 a.m. and then I'll do 6 to 12, 12 to 6. But it's a six-hour trip, 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. I'll, I'll be at the ramp at like 7.30, get the boat in the water, and generally have it everything ready to rock when the customer shows up. And uh, they step in the boat. They just got to bring clothes for the weather and snacks and drinks. And I got all the, the tackle, all the bait, and everything ready to go. And they hop on board, and then we start try to put a big one in the boat. So I also noticed that you do a lot of like overnight camping trips, um wasn't sure if that was something that you offer or was that just for friends, family, maybe filming? Well, I, I don't film guide trips. I, I filmed a few, but that's just been times where I've been in a pinch as far as footage that I have to edit. And then I have somebody who's, you know, open to the idea of videography, whatever, that type of stuff. 
Um, but for the, for the most part, 99% of 90, over 99% of my videos that I put out are just me and buddies fishing, but I do offer overnight camping trips, but I don't really discount it, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, it's a hundred bucks an hour for a guide trip. So if somebody wants to do a 24 hour trip, like you do the math, it's pretty pricey, but I have some people who want to do them. So I offer them. They're a good time. We have a lot of fun. I bring all the camping equipment, um, cooking equipment, do definitely do a short lunch. And then, uh, I pick camping spots based on not just comfort, but try to find one where you have a good shot at catching fish at camp. So essentially you're fishing the whole time, whether you're awake or asleep, which that's my favorite way to fish. <laughs> I want to, I want to have an opportunity every, every moment you're out there so how do you find different places at camp like how do you know what is public property and private property well i used to go get plat books at the the courthouse okay. is what i would do and then google's your friend but uh now you got so many apps like onyx and and that where you can you know essentially you, you just look at it and it tells you what's private and what's public and i'm not scared to knock on a door and get told no either and in, in fact like a lot of the places that I, I camp out um, are private, and then you get to know the, the person who owns it and be, end up becoming pretty good friends with them. <laughs> this is going really well, by the way. It's almost like I sent you the questions beforehand because it seems like every, every way you answer a question is kind of helping me lead up to the next one. So I wanted to ask you, because you do a ton of footage, uh, what are some of the challenges you face you know, trying to balance filming and fishing at the same time? Oh, um, I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I have my filming set up in a way where it doesn't really interfere with the fishing process much. Like, I keep it simple. I got two GoPros. Um, one's either mounted to a tripod or an arm on my kayak or something on my boat. And then I got one I wear on my chest that is my audio. And I just, I treat the... When I, when I decided I wanted to do this, well, the, when I found out you could make money on YouTube, which was funny because I was making videos for a while before I ever realized you could make a nickel off of it. Mm. And when I, when I found out that I'm like, sweet gas money, <laughs> you know, yeah. like I can go fishing a couple more times a month. Um, I also, I mean, I, I prioritize the fishing over the, the videography, but I include the videography kind of like. You know, I take the time to put sinkers on the fish rods. I take the time to put the cameras on the camera mounts. And it takes me literally two minutes to get set up for filming. And I've added some B-roll, but I'll, uh, I'll film that with my phone. Mm -hmm. And I'll, do, I'll just do that while I'm sitting around waiting for a bite. So it's, it's pretty, it's, it's not a big deal, you know, is basically uh, what I'm getting at. And it doesn't really interfere with the fishing process much at all. I can only think of maybe one or two fish. There might be more, but I can only think of one or two fish that I lost and it may or may not have been a result of me messing with a camera. So having some background in video editing myself, I know how time consuming it is and I have nowhere near as much footage as you shoot. So, so how do you do that? It seems like, do you edit the videos yourself? Because it seems like your turnaround time is only a couple of days. Um, I edit my, the majority of my own videos. I've had a few where I've outsourced them. Like somebody pitches me like, oh, I'd love to edit videos for me, for you. And I'll say, all right, edit one. We'll see how good you are. And then there's a, a family friend who really enjoys editing video. And occasionally, so I tried to pay him and he's like, no, um, I'll edit a video, but you have to take me fishing. I'm like done. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, but as far as that goes, like I, I just, I wake up early when I'm on a good routine. I'm, I'm up at five in the morning and then I edit and that's the time where I'm like the most dialed mm -hmm. as, as far as being efficient use of time. So that five to eight or nine range. So I, I edit video then and you do over the years, you just get better at it and you get faster at it. You learn your pro your editing program a little bit better and just become more efficient and I don't know. Well, I say I become more efficient, but then as I become more efficient, I start trying to add more things and be more detail oriented. But, you know, what's that law where a job will take as much time as you allow it? Video editing is <laughs> a lot like that. Yeah. 
So if I have three hours, I can get a video done in three hours. But if I have six hours, suddenly it takes me six hours to edit the video. <laughs> you know, I've never heard that before, but I'm going to look that up because that actually makes a lot of sense. So I've watched a lot of your earlier videos and you didn't fish tournaments, but you are now. And I actually watched one the other day. You came in 11th place. Uh, can you kind of walk us through what a, a catfish tournament is like? Uh, I mean, it varies a ton based on the trail you're fishing. Local trails are a little more laid back. The The larger uh, national trails are a little more, uh, I don't know what the word for it is. People are a little more competitive, I guess you'd say. Essentially, you, you some of them you register beforehand. Some of them you register at the boat ramp the morning before. Like, I'm going to fish one Saturday. and you show up hour before whatever register launch your boat and go fishing uh, but the big ones you you need to pay your your entry fee beforehand and then uh, you want to get there probably half hour to an hour before launch time and get your boat in the water and then a lot of them are trailering events so you can drive to wherever you want to fish some of them are like blast off events where you got to everybody launches from the same location but um every one of them's got their own specific set of rules so um as far as that side goes but you then you go fishing and then you come back and you you get in the weigh-in line and you weigh in what you got and i like to hang out afterwards and shoot the breeze with it with everybody and yeah. it, it's a good time you know i i try to you know enjoy the social aspect of it as much as anything and then you're you know, it pushes you. At least competition pushes me to get better, and I've definitely gotten better. Still not good, but I've gotten better. Is it always three fish, or maybe sometimes five? Does it change depending on where you're at? Oh, yeah. Like, regulations play a big part. So, if you're on the Missouri River, the majority of those tournaments are three fish, um, any size, because there's no size restrictions on the Missouri River. But down on the Tennessee River you can only have one fish over 34 inches per person. So most of these tournaments are partner tournaments and you, uh, as a, as a conglomerate of your partners, you can have two over 34 inches to weigh in, but every other fish has to be under that mark. They call them overs and unders. So one tournament I fished this winter was a three fish weigh in. You have your two overs and one under that, and then the one, last one I fished, you could have five. So you could have two overs and three unders okay. would be your best best stringer. Or you could weigh in five unders or or three unders, depending on how, you know, the total number of fish. But it just varies a lot from tournament to tournament, body water to body water. Most of it's based on local regulations. Okay. So I have a couple fun questions for you now. Does Skip count as a partner? No. Uh, I mean, I don't have to... He doesn't have to have a fishing license, so All right. so he doesn't count. All right. But he is kind of he kind of goes with the boat. If somebody were to book a guide trip, Skip's probably going to be on board, unless it's going to be really rough or you know like windy or um, rainy and cold. Um, I do have an enclosure, and I, some I'll still sometimes bring him anyway. But he's less likely to go then. But if the weather's decent at all, he he's he tags along. He's on the boat right now. Nice. Sleeping on this little dog bed under the steering wheel. <laughs> That's awesome. So before I ask you this one, I, I want to let you know that I am on your team here, but how much crap do you get for wearing Crocs? Zero. I get crap for a lot of things, but nobody gives me a hard time over the Crocs. Or maybe I just don't don't pay attention to that because like anybody who you know, has anything bad to say about Crocs just isn't a very fun person, and I don't really care. <laughs> Well, I, I have a lot of people give me crap for Crocs, and I will tell you that personally, I think it is the ultimate fishing shoe, especially walking around in the mud or how many times I need to go into the water to grab fish or, or something. And, you know, I just stand outside and two, three minutes later, my feet are completely dry. It's amazing. Yeah. The only time I don't like Crocs is if it's like super duper muddy, like mud that's, you know, deeper than ankle deep and you're going to lose your Crocs. So I don't want to lose them. Uh, I'll wear boots then or water shoes. I got some good water shoes that you can cinch up pretty tight and they do a good job of, of staying on your feet and that stuff. But if it's warm out and I'm on a boat or in a kayak or just walking on sand, I'm wearing Crocs. Have you ever been to ICAST? 
Uh, one time, like four or five years ago, I actually got to go and help Whisker Seeker set up their booth and stuff. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, see if you're uh, going down this year. I'll be down there with Deeper. Okay. No, I, I I only went that one year, and maybe I'll go again in the future. I don't know, but um, I suppose I could probably finagle up a media pass. But, you know, I enjoy the fishing so good in July, too, on the for the Blue Cats that it's hard to get away. Have you ever used a deeper sonar before? Uh, yeah, when uh, I w- last time I was in the Amazon, one of the guys that went on that trip brought one. Okay. Uh, I know we're kind of getting up against it here, but do you have any tips or helpful hints for somebody just getting started in catfishing? Maybe something that you've learned that you wish you would have known in the very beginning? Um, I mean, I'm kind of... Uh, I don't know about wish I knew so much as just... Um, perspective like keep it like don't overcomplicate it keep it simple like just use natural baits don't get sucked into the weird bait thing just use night crawlers use cut cut up fish use live bait like just natural things i mean as far as fishing spots go look look for deeper water during the day and shallower water at night for the most part there's a few exceptions but if you go by that principle you're going to catch some catfish and have a good time nice uh, do you have any shout outs, any companies you want to plug real quick? Oh yeah. Like Waterland sunglasses or, I mean, every one of my sponsors is kind of, uh, it, well, with the exception of striker, they're, they're just like the best <laughs> as far as fishing apparel goes. And I'll die on that hill, you know, but every, every one of my sponsors is really good bang for your buck type stuff, which that's kind of my mindset. And every one of them is, is companies that, have, that I, I use their stuff and it just makes sense. And so like Waterland sunglasses, they're not coast as quality, but they're for the money. I mean, you can't beat them. Same goes with those PC fun reels. Like I talked highly of them earlier because I think highly of them. Like they, for what you get, for what you spend is absolutely awesome. And then mm-hmm. striker, I mean, they're, they're just top of the line. You got to pay for it, but I mean, you, you get what you pay for. it. So all, all them, man, like, they treat me good and I'm just, just love being a part of those, those companies. So I remember on your last video I watched, uh, you dropped a promo code for the reel that you're using. Can you remind me of what that promo code was? Yep. Uh, the PC fund is RC 15. Uh, same goes for the waterlands. Like, um, either that promo code will save you 15% on both of them. And I mean, those Alios 400s, they're like a hundred and, 50 bucks and you use that promo code it takes off like 2250 and if you keep an eye on them they'll they'll drop down to like 120 at times and then you use that promo code again and you got you can get one of those reels for like a hundred dollars nice. pretty freaking good deal yeah i agree i mean that's that's a really good deal is there anything you think we forgot to talk about anything you want to bring up real fast uh nothing that really jumps out at me man like we've covered a whole bunch of stuff and like I said, anything that involves fishing, I'm I'm all about talking about it, and uh, we covered a lot of fishing. Well, Spencer, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you not only taking the time to talk with me, but, you know, doing it in like a public setting where, you know, other listeners and other people can, you know, benefit from your lifelong experience, and um, man, it was awesome. Like I said, I was super pumped that that you agreed to uh hop on the podcast and i'm still pretty excited about it for sure and well i appreciate the invitation like like i have people who ask me to to hop on podcasts some amount but it's not like every week or even every month so you know it's really not that big of a deal i enjoy it well i certainly hope after hearing that if people don't already follow you going on instagram and especially youtube typing in river certified (laughs) Spencer, thank you for taking the time, my friend. Sounds good, man. Appreciate the invitation and had a good time.